Welcome to Prada's new series, Possible, Prada's Pro Possible Conversations. And today we're going to focus on the ocean as a possible ally to the virus. And I'm your host today. And my name is Francesca Thiessen Bonamisa. Um, I'm an ocean advocate for quieter oceans. I'm a passionate art collector and I love to commission new works that deal with really important topics of our time. And my guest today is Vladimir Albini, and he's the Executive Secretary of the IOC from UNESCO. And um, well, that's not the International Olympics Committee, for those of you who don't know, but the UNESCO has a special department that focuses on the oceans. And this is our top man there, and I'm really excited to have him online. I'm looking for him, Vladimir. Let's hope he gets online. Vladimir, thanks for joining us. It's really wonderful. Um, I need to turn off connect. Yeah, so that there are lots of hearts for us both, but um, no comments. Oh, yeah. It's very distracting <laughs> as well. Vladimir, this is wonderful to be together with you. We've been friends for a while and we're connected by the ocean itself. Um, from very different points of view, you are a lead scientist in climate change and the executive secretary of the, of the IOC, which is a huge body um, in, in, within UNESCO and the United Nations. You're a very influential man, actually. And I'm like a small art collector with an NGO private initiative that focuses on the oceans as well. So let the oceans connect us. Welcome. I thank you for, for the uh, for the interest in IOC and, and from from the outside from from the outside for, for the for that we that we have from you. So as you said, not Olympic committee, but you know it's really a, a challenging thing, like a, every every achievement, and we really need to understand what is happening in the seventy percent of the area of the planet behind the surface, which is not transparent to radio waves. So this is a big challenge for us to understand that. And I think this is exactly what we're trying to do. We are observing the ocean. We are uh, trying to help people uh, to have warnings about dangerous events. And uh, for example, recently there was uh, a little tsunami in, in the Adriatic Sea. Uh, and also there were some tsunamis in some other part of the world. And you remember the tsunami in the Indian Ocean that killed oh. more than 200,000 people. So uh, we, we are now uh, working very much on the climate change, on so many things. So that is exactly the role of science. Our sure. planet now like requires many. Sorry, but that's like an octopus being on very, very many important topics all at the same time, with every single part of their body being part of their brain. Isn't that how it feels? <laughs> you know, uh, Fra Francesca, you know, I recently watched one of the uh, shows, uh, one of the ex exhibitions. You also alluded to octopus. I think there's some, uh, some, I don't know, if you, I don't know, interested in that. You know, uh, I, would, I can give you a story about... Uh, a different animal uh, and uh, uh, you know this was in 2015 in in paris during the the famous climate conference uh, there was a breakfast uh, re devoted to the ocean and one of the uh, very important uh, you know and talented uh, charismatic persons in the in the in the whole domain of the ocean silva earl at that time was also advocating for the role of the ocean to be reflected in climate and she she called the ocean the blue elephant in the room. So it, I think to some extent it remains this. The ocean is around, but uh, uh, everything that is happening, but sometimes it is not noticed, and we have to overcome this. And that, I think, this uh, notion of blue elephant is, is going really long way. But COVID is impacting over 1.5 billion students so ocean literacy is high on your agenda uh, imagine what is happening uh, in in the coastal regions that are prone to tsunamis and uh, people may be quarantined there so mm, how yeah. do you manage to, to kill them in case of a tsunami if they're not supposed to leave the, the the premises so we are working on that we are trying to understand what is the impact 
of the uh, uh, lockdown, on the observations, or on, on the research, uh, and how to manage uh, such threats that are uh, always with us, like threats of tsunami, tropical cyclone. You remember the tropical cyclone Harold in the, in the, in the Pacific that uh, was uh, devastating uh, for, for several countries. And people had to also deal with the coronavirus at the time. Difficult times indeed, but you know, we are positive. Very. Yeah, it is, it is. But I think one of the biggest achievements, and I think it's something that everybody's very excited about, is the upcoming decade of ocean science. And, you know, I know that you had a lot to do with bringing that uh, forward and bringing it to everybody's attention, which I think it has reached a lot of people now. Can you tell us a bit about the Ocean Decade of Science? Uh, oh, thank you for this question, uh, Francesca. You know, I think I, see, I indeed, indeed see a lot of hearts uh, going like for me from, 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 from the deep ocean. So like, uh, like oxygen bubbles, you know, it, it's wonderful. So I think we have a lot of people uh, watching us now. And uh, it is mm. uh, also an opportunity. Uh, thank you for the question, indeed. Uh, so once again, the United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Every word matters because we would like to live happily and the definition of sustainable development is, is to live well but not to preclude further generations, generations to come from the ability to also live happily. That is the, the uh, classical definition of sustainable development and for that ocean has to serve we have to also serve the ocean in return. Uh, ocean can no longer be used as, as a, uh, basically, as a, as a French says, as, uh, as, as a garbage uh, uh, can. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, we, we, we all know what is happening with the plastic of the ocean. Everyone knows this. But, you know, not many people know that uh, uh, the production of oxygen from the ocean is reducing because of several effects. <laughs> Because that the ocean water is getting uh, less al alkalinic, it's getting more acidic, and this actually uh, it impacts ocean organisms. And there are so many things that need to be addressed. And for that, we have to have eyes on the ocean. We have the observations, signs that lead the ocean. And the most important paradigm, Francesca, is that from now on, we need to have the ocean managed. Like in the case of coronavirus, a person who is healed requires supervision, requires help. So science also needs now to help the ocean to be managed sustainably. Do you, do you think, I mean, obviously one of the things that we've been excited about is the fact that you call for a lot of partnerships outside of your normal circles to NGOs and activists around the world that have lots of ocean initiatives, conservation sites around the world, also philanthropists and uh, individual people that can contribute, make commitments to this initiative. So how can everybody get involved with this? It's not just science. Okay. So it is very simple, you know, in order to all the community to be armed, to help the ocean, uh, well, uh, to, to, to recover its health, we need good science. And that's exactly that glue, that science that will enable the activities, good investments in the ocean health, good investments in the ocean industries, investments into management of the ocean. And also, of course, people will know more about the ocean and that will make them better. So that is also incredibly important. So that was... Uh, answering your question i heard it great so um from our side in the art world i mean we've been focusing um i founded tba 21 in about 20 years ago and i'm focusing on commissioning works about topics that are really urgent and the oceans have become extremely an urgent topic so 10 years ago we founded the tba 21 academy and it has a home in venice called ocean space uh, which speaks to a very big, a different audience than the one you speak to, because we commission artists and architects and musicians and composers to work together with scientists, opinion leaders, um, as well, legal experts, indigenous voices from all around the world to come together and to bring their savoir, their knowledge and use 
look at it through the lens of art and translate that into a different public and engage them also with a huge amount of research, a different type of research, but we call it artistic research. And what I think is interesting about artists, which are the antenna of our time and have been since the Renaissance and have been speaking to us about issues that are sometimes too vague, sometimes too complex or even too explosive for us to always comprehend and articulate. And um, artists can do that through a visualization process and also by trans um, transferring their knowledge and collecting knowledge from different disciplines. Because that always, that seems to be the talk of today, right? That, that everybody's working in a specialization in their silos. And somehow artists can bring these silos not together in a confused way, but actually speak to that silence that actually exists in between those silos and um, communicate a very, very important message that people can really appreciate. And there being numerous entrance points, so from an aesthetic point of view, but also from deep knowledge. Um, for instance, the project that is now waiting in Venice to be opened, because of course, as we know, the pandemic has shut down every single cultural institution in Italy. Um, it's called Oceans in Transformation, and it is designed by some architects called Territorial Agency, and their idea was to collect big data on the oceans. And you know more than anyone else how much data that represents. And for the outside world, it's incredibly difficult to understand, to comprehend. And so they visualize these ocean trajectories that, in a way, have made it possible for us to understand a complex mixture of things that are interrelated, such as climate change, but that obviously impacts then the sea level rise, but also the overfishing, the nuclear tests that were and have been, you know, 50 years ago to um, political borders and easy zones and many of these things that, you know, most people sit around on the beach and go, I think I can see forever when they can't. They can only see about five or six miles away. Um, but, you know, there are so many different things that are, under the blanket of the surface of the ocean that we don't understand um, and that need to sort of come out in many, many different forms. And in a way, I think the art world gives shape and helps people feel what science helps us understand in a way. It's a um, very important collaboration between the arts. And I think it's just been a while since the arts have had an opportunity to show how much they can actually contribute because often I go to those UN conferences and I see a big whale made out of secondhand flip-flops collected on beaches. And whilst that does carry a message, you will agree with me, it's a very simple message that needs to be told, but at the same time, the arts has a different function in our lives, don't you think? You I know, know you're... You know, I, 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 I can also, I think I'm guessing now what you said, but the, I, I, because I didn't hear you. But at the same time, uh, you know, we are kind of hard scientists. You know, we, we are in the worlds of integrals, you know, uh, equations, uh, also observations. But, you know, what resonates with people is, is our emotions. So uh, in the San Lorenzo church, you know, it made a very strong impact on me because, you know, I th thought that, you know, it would be appealing to people, you know, it will be changing people. So in order to save the ocean, we need to change people. And there are an incredible increasing amount of women that I think play a very vital role in ocean conservation these days. And one of them is uh, our head in, in uh, UNESCO, Francesca Santoro, who's charging, leading the charge with ocean uh, literacy program. But do you have a lot of women scientists also in the IOC program? In the ocean sciences, 38 percent of the of the workforce are women and we have now more women that are working and then the other branches of science and we will do more because this is one of our targets so 50 50 it will be 50 50 so i've gone on to the comments and the questions that the people have written into because they're really good questions 
And I just answered the one about the hardest challenges. And I thought about, you know, how people who are working um, very individually at the moment find community in their work, through their work. And um, I've heard rumors that actually some of the research scientists in the ocean field, at least, are really rejoicing because they're able to really get on with some very important work that they have um, on their cards, but are constantly rushing around giving talks and lectures. So they're actually being able to get on with their work. I think you're experiencing the same thing. Can you talk yeah. about that? You know, this, this, I wouldn't call it the hardest challenge in our lives, of course. But, you know, uh, working from home uh, makes it possible, of course, to concentrate on things that are, are, are supposed to be done. And, and recently uh, finished three to four documents, an article. So we are working now uh, in such a way that we can really put, uh, put pen to paper and, and, and complete something. But uh, I wouldn't call it a challenge, you know. We have to use this opportunity maybe to, uh, you know, collect thoughts and, you know, and reorganize a little bit. But the real challenge is, is, is different. For example, you know, we have to monitor uh, climate in the ocean. These records have to be continuous. And if you lose the continuity of these records, it will be a very bad thing for climate science. Mm. So that is, that is a challenge. Uh, so the challenge is how to, again, I, I'm returning to the issue of how to warn people about tsunami uh, in, in the conditions when they're, they're, they're confined. So there are some really big challenges. And what is also more important, our challenges are smaller in, in comparison with those people who really need to work uh, for for their for their lives for their food so th these are real challenges so we are I think we are doing fine in comparing with those people what is important that you know we have to have some empathy to those people and that is that change uh, and also I think the challenge is to teach people to have that empathy that would be for me the most important thing. <laughs> teach people about empathy you can give them the sentiment they can give them the inspiration to be emphatic and that is actually something i think the art world plays an important role in but i would give you another example for instance one of our, our residency program is housed is in the alligator head foundation in jamaica uh, in portland where we've actually instigated a six mile uh, conservation site so it's a scientifically driven project but of course, one of the main efforts that we make is to try and work with our community uh, because we've displaced a lot of fishermen, uh, their livelihoods. This is a very, you know, poor, poor area of Jamaica as well. And since the closure of the schools, and we're very in contact with the schools because we work a lot and closely with them in order to, to work on ocean literacy program delivered to us by UNESCO and, and one of our own making as well. And, uh, and to work with the artists that come on this residency as well. We know the schools. And the main issue is they have no access to food and even basic sanitation. So we've started a program to feed, you know, to give food packages to every single one of the kids from a hundred families from all around our district. And I think every single organization, be it scientific, humanitarian, uh, or in the arts, which is somehow all of our organizations seem to be a combination of all of those, need to take this action seriously and reach out to their communities and provide food and support and sustenance. You know, um, but one of, one of the things, we've got two minutes, but one oh. of the things I need to do is make a big shout out to Italy. Because one of the, one of the most moving and challenging evidence that Culture is really at the heart of people, and it's um, it's the hope is that what is the singing in the streets? Wasn't that absolutely amazing? Wasn't that proof that art and culture is really something fundamental to being able to deal with even the darkest times? It's a real shout out. And then you saw those dancers on their balconies in New York City and people singing together. And it was just so incredible. And it is really the ultimate proof, I think, that arts have the potential to change the world we live in. And I'm really convinced of that. And I think that the arts has a huge role to play in the coming months, years, um, into the sort of change that you and I really hope for, and I think everybody's hoping for. Um, that's it from us, Vladimir.
Francesca, we um, need to just mention that Prada is donating generous amount of money for every single one of these Prada conversations, possible conversations, sorry. Um, so that's really in addition to their partnership with UNESCO, and I think that's really amazing. I really want to thank UNESCO for, for being there, for always yes. supporting us, for being our friends, um, as though we're a little bit out on the arts loop, but I think we're getting closer together. And, of course, I want to thank the TDA Academy team in Venice and um, the Ocean Space and all of those that work on our team tirelessly for the ocean because we're really, really committed. So that's it from us. I if, if I may, I would like uh, to, to also thank Prada, to thank you, Francesca, for what you do for the ocean, uh, also for UNESCO and for IUC. And, you know, I would like to conclude from my part by quoting my famous compatriot, Fedor Dostoevsky. It's not actually him, but one of his personages that, uh, that said it's the, the beauty that will save the world. So this is what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vladimir. Wonderful. It's great talking to you. Thanks, Thank brother. You.